Hello. Welcome to this presentation for the Center of Southwest Studies. I am Connie Marquez, and I was honored to be the fellowship of this year's um, wonderful opportunity that I had to experience at Fort Lewis. As a fellow, I had to do research that was linked to the resources of the Center of Southwest Studies. After asking the staff what was uh, important for them for me to accomplish as a fellow, they referred me to a wonderful collection called Paral, P-A-R-R-A-L, that has been in the center for several years, and it's a microfilm collection. That triggered my uh, curios curiosity as a historian, and as soon as I started working on this topic, I found it wonderful, and I hope you do after listening to this presentation. So let's start with the PowerPoint that I prepare for today's talk. This PowerPoint will take us to the different resources that we have in, in these um, resources of the center. I named this presentation Traveling in Time with Paral Archives, 1643, 1665, because those were the years that I was able to, uh, to read in the documents that they have. The collection, though, starts earlier and finished in 1821, which is the year of the Mexican independence. So let's start with the topics for this talk. I will address the importance of having this collection at the Center of Southwest Studies at Fort Lewis College. Later, I will describe how is organized the collection and its years. Third, I will talk about the geographical and historical context so we can understand this collection. For my favorite part, we will be a little bit troubling in time for uh, I will be describing the examples of what we can find in uh, this collection. We will be talking about specific cases that take us back in time in the 1600s. And finally, I will also talk about the squat skills required, which are three that I can think of. The paleography, of course, knowledge in the ancient writing, also colonial Spanish because it's a specific type of language, and historical knowledge of the region and colonial times. I will later conclude with the final remarks. So let's start with the importance of having these resources. This is a current picture of Paral, which is in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. Now you can think, why Chihuahua and what has to do with the Southwest history? Well, in the 1600s and until the uh, 1840s, Paral was linked, Mexico was linked to Southwest history. As many of you know, that it was territory of Mexico. After a war, better to say an invasion by the USA, half of the territory of Mexico was lost and became American soil. Now, in the 1600s, the time of this presentation, that was different because it was all together as a one. Actually, as the history of uh, the colonial times evolves, we will see that the more the people were settling in, 
the more towns, villas, and even cities were founded, the more the territory was controlled and organized into different provinces. Uh, let's take a look of what is what we have here. As I said, my research covers the years of the 1600s, but the archive actually goes from 1631 from 18, to 1821. That is almost three centuries of history in which, as you can imagine, many things change. I also want to show you these two examples of documents, which we will be talking later in the section of traveling in time, to see, for you to see some uh, examples of this handwriting and particularly the seals, the government seals that certified and legalized these documents as part of the government of the official records. You can see here uh, two seals, uh, one from uh, 1645, another from 1644, that shows that many documents were reused and in many cases the seals were also juxtaposed into one and another depending on the year. Uh, another example that we can talk about having this collection can be, of course, found at the website of the Center of Southwest Studies. This, uh, organize, this collection is organized in different categories. You can go to the website in the in the slash inventory slash aral and you can find the description that i'm sharing with you which as you can see it cons it is constituted by 324 roles it also has a little bit of the introduction of what it's in the archives in the archive and how it is organized as well its years one of the wonderful things of this arch archive is that it was previously organized and it's easier for the researchers. There is um, a book, an index, that proved to be very, very uh, useful for my research. And I want to thank Nick about uh, giving me, lending me this uh, book, this index that made my work easy, at least easier than without knowing what was in those roles. This collection was compiled by researchers from the University of Arizona that knowing the geographical conditions in colonial times in which Arizona and as well Colorado were part of the Spanish, uh, of the new Spain, the Spanish kingdom in the Americas, they uh, realized that it was important, it had a high historical value to have this collection. So in the years of 1959 and 1960, as said by the index, they accomplished several trips, four trips to be exact. And they went and talked to the uh, people at the municipal archive in Paral, Chihuahua. And along with uh, Dr. Charles Di Peso, Dr. Renaldo Rosaldo, Renato Rosaldo, and Robert Anderson accomplished these trips to film to microfilm, I should say, this collection. It, the collection, as you will see uh, in some evidences of the documents that I put for this PowerPoint, you will see they are 
different writings, but some are from centuries later, actually in the 1800s, perhaps when this collection was first organized. In the 19th century, there is this uh, movement or this change in the history in which it was so important to base your records or your history, your research into records, into written records. This shift in history meant a lot. And that is also with the influence of the positivism in which the history wanted to be considered and consolidated as science. And for that, you needed to achieve a scientific methodology to base your research on. So this is a time in which many archives in Mexico were organized by those 19th century minds, researchers, and in many cases, just uh, people in charge of the archives with no need or not uh, longing for historical research, but rather just uh, the idea of preserve them for future researchers. And that was wonderful. So based on the evidence that we find in documents of Parral archive, we can see that in the 1800s, somehow they got the idea to, of reorganize and perhaps save these documents from complete destruction based on where they were, the conditions that in some cases, as you will see, uh, by the images that I'm, I will show you, in some cases there were terrible conditions that show the uh, marks of water, humidity, fungus, and just uh, even, even I dare to, to say, uh, even some rat, uh, rat evidence, meaning they, rat and mice, probably fed themselves with uh, this paper that for most of the part, knowing from my experience in other archives, uh, was made of cotton. It was the very uh, high quality paper, very expensive, and that's why it exists. We can understand why they reused the sheets because it was really expensive to uh, to buy, even for the government, even for the government. Actually, usually the municipality will have to, or or the the town will have to buy with the public resources their own paper because the government won't give them anything. They will have to pay for their own paper. Okay, how do we know that? Because there's a watermark in many documents, and if you trace those watermarks, you can find that many of those uh, papers, those pages were actually imported from the old world. Imagine the cost, okay? Going back to the classification of this archive, as you can see in this slide, it has five categories that were created by Guillermo Gallardo, who was in charge of the municipal archive in Chihuahua when these Arizona researchers arrived. And they based this classification with the previously existent classification, which as I say, is very useful for the researchers. We have five sections. One is the military reports, and administration is called Causas Administrativas y de Guerra, which I will talk about as I have uh, many documents on this section one. The section two, which is the documents that I found most, which pertains to records of sale of mining property and land action which is Minas Solares y Terrenos. 
And the number three, the protocols, which I found several, especially one that was already printed. And it's, it's a very interesting example of uh, government orders for these uh, different territories of His Majesty, right? Finally, in the sections, we also find section four, which are civil causes, that by the time frame that I uh, had the, the, the opportunity to do, are scarce. It has to do also that the civil court cases are more frequent when the population grows, when the town or real, as it was, or royal, as Parral was called, uh, was growing. I'm pretty sure that if I, my research had been extended to the 18th century uh, and to the, to the 17th century, I would have found more civil court cases as the population on, on this uh, town of Parral was evidently multiplying as the years went by. Actually, it reached its peak by the 1800s. The other section it are uh, the documents that constitute part of criminal causes, criminal court cases. And that again was, uh, is mostly for the 1700 documents as in the 1600s, I wasn't able to find many as later on, according to the index. And the section six, which is uh, unidentified documents that do not uh, cover any of these specific topics. Let's go to the part three of my presentation geographical and historical context. In order to appreciate and give the value of this wonderful Paral Archives collection, we must understand what are we talking about? As you know, I started my presentation saying that Colorado State and the Southwest region for the most part, was part of the Spanish kingdom. The Spanish kingdom was organized in different categories. It was organized by kingdoms, of course, under the umbrella of what is called the vice royalty, virreinato. Under this big umbrella, vice royalty, there were kingdoms, there were territories, and they were Capitanias, in which, uh, depending on the size, uh, had different characteristics. In the case of today's Colorado state, it was part of a kingdom called Nueva Vizcaya, which we can see here in this map. If you follow the map, you can see that in the green part, the, there is the, the kingdoms of Mexico and New Galicia, Guadalajara, Zacatecas. And then we have also the Capitanías Generales or the general captains, in which are smaller ter territories and usually for bigger causes or for affairs that demand more attention such as having a military base in the 18th century um, and 17th century with the Bourbon reforms uh, are linked to kingdoms. And we also have Comandancias Generales, which ha ha are administrative dependent usually from the kingdoms. Uh, in the case of uh, the Commandancia or commandant, general commandant, we can see that there were two main ones, the west and the east. And in the case of New 
Vizcaya or Nueva Vizcaya, again, which was part of today's Durango and Parral that we are talking about today. In the case of this general uh, comment, you can see that it's linked to Santa Fe of New Mexico. And you can see here the different uh, separations. We have uh, part of Texas, part of, of New Mexico into the new Vizcaya. And then we have the California in high and low along with Sonora and Sinaloa. Let's take a look of the next uh, slide so you can see a better uh, you can have a better idea of where do we, where are we talking on the political organization. Now, what is the importance of knowing how the territory was organized? It was a high, highly important. Because as the conquest expand and people populated the different uh, territories. It was mandatory. It was a must to organize them for different reasons. For measuring the population, for taxing the population most likely, more importance for, for the crown that was just eager to get a hold on all the economical resources, but also to gripe the history of these regions. Mm, the geographical division also tell us about specific characters of the region in terms of weather, fauna, animals, you no know, uh, economical situation, and also weather, weather, climate conditions, uh, the territory, if it was more, more uh, prone to agricultural activities rather than mining activities. Because at the time, we're talking about the 1500s to the 1800s, three centuries of colonial times, there were mostly two activities or perhaps three. One was, of course, the uh, agricultural activities sowing and uh, harvesting the land. The second activity, perhaps the main one, especially in the earlier years, the mining activity. And then we have the commerce or trading activities. Those were the three main activities during the colonial times. It is known that the Spaniards were eager to find gold you know, all these different legends of uh, El Dorado and uh, other tales from the Middle Ages in which the uh, explorers, the conquistadors, seem to care only for finding precious minerals. But it is also known that many of them were looking for the place for them to grow, for them to have a family, for them to make a living because the small Spain territory, uh, Spanish territory was so difficult. Most of the land, if not all the land was already owned by the nobility. And the middle and lower class nobilities or Hidalgos as Cortes were left without opportunities to have to make a life, to, to have um, um, a high economical level, to make business, to improve their economical and social status. So many of them went to a long trip and a hardship through across the ocean and arrived to this continent with the hope of not only conquering, Con, uh, make a conquest, but also with the hope of making a good living and becoming someone. This was called, this was the, described by the wonderful Spanish writer Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, the writer, the author of Don Quixote, 
that uh, it was to make the Americas, to do the Americas, hacer las Americas. It meant to become someone. So before the population started spreading and generations were born into this new land, it was so important to organize it for, as I said, different reasons from monetary to social and religious reasons, of course. The, the conquest of uh, the natives for both the weapons and the religion conquest, religious conquest, the conquest with the sword and the cross. In this slide, you can see the big umbrella that the viceroyalty was, and then the kingdoms. The viceroyalty was a sub kingdom besides the crown or the king uh, of Spain. You can see here they were different provinces, the western and the east provinces, in which we find uh, today's Colorado. You can see the new Vizcaya. It is hard to point it out specifically which today territories, which ones were part of these geographical colonial designations. Because as you know, the, the territory has been changed, the names are not the same, and the territory has come to, uh, has passed through different designations. So when you say, when in colonial times, when, which states were part of the kingdom of New Galicia, for example? Depends the years. Because in many cases, we're thinking about territories that were not conquered or becoming part of the Spanish kingdom. So it depends on the date. For my research in the 1600s, this was pretty much what I found in terms of geographical organization. As you can see, the uh, kingdom of New Vizcaya was part of the Western internal provinces that was also chaired with Santa Fe of New Mexico and with the high and low California. Let's go back to the map and you can see them here, right? Sonora, Sinaloa, and we also have the kingdom or the territory of Santa Fe of New Mexico, which was still is border with Durango and Colorado state. We also have the Capitanias that were organized also depending on the territory they chair, including the farthest one of the Philippines that made the King Charles V declare, in my empire, the sun never sets. Why? Because it covered the both parts of the planet, meaning Asia, then Africa, and then continue to America. Yes, it was indeed a vast empire the biggest empire of all. But later, Spain lost everything. So it was just for a moment. I mean, for some years, but still it wasn't permanent. Like nothing in life, right? And there were always changes. Nothing stay, uh, remains the same. Let's see this map, which is a pretty recent map of the 19th century. It was made uh, in the in the 19th century, but envisioning what was the colonial times. It even has an estimated population. And right here in the center, you find the new Vizcaya, the territory that it, co it is covered today by Colorado. You also see in the distant part, the border with the USA, right here. And 
in most of this part of California, the high California, as they call it, you can see right here that there's not indication of uh, towns like the rest of the map, which is cluttered, as you can see, by names of the different provinces and kingdoms. If we take a closer look of this map, and I'm sorry I don't have a better quality of uh, the resolution of this map, you can see the province of Biscaya, of New Biscaya, we should say, because Biscaya is in Spain. New Biscaya is in America. You can see that it is uh, surrendered by different towns, but also you can see the geographical description, for example, this lake here. And also you can see that in some cases this, uh, I don't know how, how good you can see, but uh, you can see some uh, circles, which means they were uh, cities or at least well-established towns. The towns that once existed during colonial times were not many, I mean, not all of them have remained. In the case of Parral, Chihuahua, it did remain still, but many, many cities and towns that you find in the ancient maps, they no longer exist. And it is sad to know that uh, what was was a thriving population, a thriving town full of people and economical activities ceased to exist once the minerals uh, ceased to be productive. Uh, the mines uh, were not as rich as they once were. They just depleted the, the resources, as in the case of agricultural towns that with the mining uh, activities slowing down or closing, there was no people living there and there was no need to produce the food to support this mining population. So we constantly see, and this is the case of the new Vizcaya, we constantly see the, the pair or the balance of agricultural farming towns with mining industrial towns. Remember, back in those years, in the 1600s, the industrial activity was mostly mining activity. There was not a still the industrial revolution that brought a new kind of commerce. In the 1600s, we're talking about harvesting the land and exploiting the mines. Those were the two main, and as I said, the commerce, which was selling, trading from the agricultural activities to the mining activities in between, as we will see in these documents. This is another map, is the map of uh, 1792. And this is again, a very interesting map of the territory of the new Biscaya. In this territory, you find lots of uh, hills and, and in general, uh, rich geographical conditions. Mostly, of course, as we know, in, the, in desert areas that were not as prone as the fertile fertile center part of Mexico, but still people managed to harvest the land. You can see how many hills and mountains are part of this new Vizcaya kingdom. You can also see right here in the red letters, if you can identify them, you can see the numbers of the native nations that were uh, the original settlers of this uh, territory that were pushed away by the Spaniards once they set in or settled in these lands. 
The information of this map is very interesting because this map show us the description of the different resources, geographical resources. For example, you can see it was ordered by the Don Pedro de Nava y Portier, who was the common commandant of the West Provinces. He was uh, in charge of the kingdom of New Vizcaya, among other provinces. He ordered this map by an engineer, and this is me reading what is this information. It says, extraordinary engineer, Don Juan de Pagasartundia, which is a tricky last name, is Basque, of Basque origin, um, which is another language, you know, it's so difficult, Basque. Not link, it's not a link, it's not a Latin language, by the way, Basque. So this uh, engineer extraordinaire of Basque origin did this map that constitute one of the richest resources to envision, to start traveling in time in those years in Paral and the new Vizcaya. Uh, it says that it has, it has fully recollected all descriptions provided by those with the most knowledge. And it has even, which I did not translate, but it has symbology that is explained. For example, the uh, presidios, you know, these uh, defense towns uh, that were organized in order to face the natives and to uh, secure the Spanish and Mestizo population. It also shows the rivers and lagoons the haciendas, which can be mining haciendas or agricultural haciendas. And you can also see the division. Let's go back again a little bit. You can see it here. You can see the uh, different symbology uh, and the different shapes that, again, is not very clear with the resolution of this map. Uh, on the historical resources for this um, historical context that I'm presenting for you in this uh, talk, we can rely in a wonderful resource that I want to thank Professor Gilliford at Fort Lewis History Department for his suggestion. He recommended me to read this wonderful book by John L. Kessel, Spain in the Southwest, which is a narrative history of colonial New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and California. His book is a very valuable resource to understand the Southwest history, and it helped me a lot in my research for the Paral archives. The author talks about the rich mines of Zacatecas discovered in the late 1940s gave undying prospect of what could be. Mining strikes of themselves drew billions, billows <laughs> of humanity as mirage after mirage was proved up. Yet, beyond an imaginary wavy line drawn across northern New Spain through Sonora, Nueva Vizcaya, Coahuila, and Nuevo León, well below the present Mexico-U.S. border, the strikes played out. North of that line, despite ever-present hope of new bonanzas, government incentives replace mineral wealth. The first settlers, Los Primeros Pobladores, recruited and subsidized by church and state, fought to build shelters, rest, subsistence, and occasionally profit from the land and raise families. Most stayed, and generations begot generations. The yield from mines, however, figured hardly at all in the colonial Southwest. 
this um, quote that I chose from the preface of Spain in the Southwest by Dr. John L. Kessel reflects upon the people living in this land of today, Parral, and today, Durango, Colorado. They were settlers and they were looking to make a living. And it all was, uh, became to a reality because of the discovery of the mines in Zacatecas. And I should add, in my local town of Guanajuato, Mexico. The discovering of the wealth of this newfound territory prompt the uh, exploitation of the surrounders. Many were travelers, were wanderers, and choose to settle in distant places. The settlement though came with a price. The price was that the original inhabitants of those territories, the natives, were not particularly happy with having to share their lands and having to submit to a way of living that they no longer, most of the cases, did not approve or lived, and especially the social conditions that were uh, the burden of social conditions that was uh, put in their lives for the Spaniards. Uh, this book also show us a map of what Kessel um, describes Central Corridor, Eastern and Pacific Corridors. You can see here in the map what the, the flux or the movement of settlement in this region. We have, of course, starting from Mexico City and then going west, east, also the Pacific Corridor, as you can see here, which covers today Texas as well. And then we have the Central Corridor, that is what prompted the creation of the new Vizcaya, and along with the province of Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was in the Central, as you can see in the map, coming from Mexico City and toured into the different sections, into the Central, the East, and the Pacific Corridor. This took place in the matter of at least three centuries. And the, the research that I did of the 1600s is at the eve of these explorations. It is the beginning of these explorations. Let's go to the fourth part of my talk, the um, traveling on time, examples of, of what we can find. Well, I only had the chance to review more than 50 documents. Um, sadly, my research, and I didn't say it before, sadly, my research was stopped by the COVID pandemic. I was in the road, in the path of uh, going to uh, register on PDF my, the documents that I selected from the different roles when everything was interrupted and we were forced, as you all know, to vacate the college and all the, all the public facilities, such as the Center of Southwest Studies. Sadly, my research was interrupted with uh, this pandemic. But still, I managed to review in the span of about two and a half months that I went to, to do the document search. I was able to manage uh, to read and to see about 50 documents in three rolls of microfilm. Uh, I review these documents with different difficulties. First, I had to manage and to learn how to use the microfilm 
uh, and the scanner, which I was held by Nick in charge of the archive. Once I managed to do that, after some failure, <laughs> I was able to found, uh, explained by Nick, that there was a highly useful option of saving the documents, the microfilm, into a PDF or a USB flash drive, which I did. And that allowed me to read in the big screen, in the biggest screen possible, these documents on microfilm. This is highly useful option. And I'm glad that the resources of the center allow researchers to copy these documents, uh, as I said, digital, digitalized, and you can work with them later because it takes, it takes uh, skills, as we will see in the following section of my talk. So I also had the wonderful resource that Nick uh, told me about it of having this index, an index that was prepared, a hard copy index of 484 pages written by Mr. and Mrs. George W. Chambers. They were part of the expedition, if you will, of researchers that went in 1959 and 1960 to Paral. They prepared this index that is very useful. In fact, you can do some research with this index as it, show, as it show us the different categories and the different organization. I have here my notes and I can tell you what we can find in these documents from the index point of view. We find a highly stratified society. We have a racial, racialized society. It was important to stay the category of the person in the matter, in the document. And there were different social rules that were expected. For example, you could not live in uh, as a common, common couple, meaning you had to be married. If not, you could be denounced by uh, not respecting the morale and the good uh, habits for this society. Uh, this is about the, the index, and I will talk more about as we move into the, uh, what we can find in these documents. The one thing that I discovered is that the index gives you a certain classification, but it's better to see the classification and the, the, the different matters in each one of the roles. So I had to review each one of the roles, discovering that some document, documents were readable and others were not. The index can tell you what is the document about, but when you want to read it yourself, you find in some cases it's impossible. As I said, many documents were damaged uh, I assume mostly by water, but also some show fungus, seeing uh, fungus uh, that have been affected by fungus, and others, as I said earlier, seem to be beaten, <laughs> have been beaten by mice and rats. That's normal, it's normal, it's sadly, sadly, especially when you talk about colonial time documents and there was not this notion of preserve nor the technology to put them in specific conditions or money, right? Uh, so the other uh, step that I had to take is to undertake my practice on paleography, colonial paleography, which I did before as uh, my, my degree in history contemplated three years of paleography. 
and I still remember my colonial time paleography lessons in which we will we will struggle with what are they saying well this research challenged me in that uh, formation previous formation that I had in into paleography science that's what I became a historian of the 19th and 20th century because it is it is very difficult anyway transcribing and translating into English more than 20 documents although I review more than 50 many of them were unreadable as I said by different reasons external factors others were also unreadable because the ink was overlapped with the with the back of the page so the ink uh, went into the paper and make this uh, mark that makes the document unreadable other documents i found were uh, annulated meaning the scribe or whoever did that consider the the matter was no longer important or maybe it had something that was not uh, convenient to know for the future we know official records are usually in many many occasions have been erased who knows what happened with that document but i found several documents that were purposely uh try to erase or just mark with ink so you could not read what was in them. Uh, then it came another challenge. Okay, you read them in Spanish. What Spanish? Colonial times Spanish, which is not easy. I will get into that later about the skills required. But I accomplished my, my duty in this research of translating into transcribing into Spanish, meaning from the manuscript to uh, a word file, and then translated into English, which was another skill required. Um, let's go back in time. In, since my first visit, to this collection, I was amazed on how these documents allows you to travel back in time and to be as close as you can get from the 1600s. Isn't that exciting? I was excited. I was reading these words. I was transported into these years and I was thinking, this is as close as you can get from the 1600s. You are reading what people said. Yes, certain people, of course, we, because we're talking about official records. We're talking about a scribe who was paid, whose job was to take the testimony of those who spoke. In many ways, the, the language was unreadable. It's just uh, you can also study the language change in these documents, but it still is a way to travel back in time. And that got me, got me so excited and so happy with this experience because I felt for a moment with the long hours of reading and transcribing and making sense of these documents, I was back in time. And that was a wonderful experience. Uh, let's see some examples. I've been talking so much about this and now I want to share with you. These are some of the nicest ones. In fact, these translations are uh, in, in a, a file that you will be able to read in the resources of the center, the report that I prepare along with this talk. In these manuscripts, you can see different types of typography. 
you can see like this one in this page. These are all from the 1640s. Um, you can see how clear it is, how neat. There's almost no uh, ink from the previous page. And this one is a little bit dirtier. It has some uh, lost in, in the edges. But still, you can read it pretty easily uh, in terms of clarity of the letter. Some of the things that I found more valuable are these signatures. The signatures is the close, as close as you can get from these real people, because usually the signatures, as you can change and you, as you can see by the changing in typography, some of these signatures are made by different people. In some cases, they seem to be by the scribe. The scribe himself uh, wrote it. And in some cases, people will just uh, sign with a cross, as many of them were illiterate. And here we see the seal of 1889, when it's most likely this archive was reorganized. So imagine, in 1889, how many years after these uh, files, the, these documents were, uh, were created? That explains also the conditions. And actually, we should thank the dryness of Chihuahua for the preservation of these documents, because believe me, in the humid regions of Veracruz or Oaxaca, Sometimes the records are no longer existent or many documents have been lost because of the humid conditions of where they were uh, put for centuries. In the case of Chihuahua, at least the dry uh, climate of the environment helped to preserve these documents. Although in many cases are completely lost. These are some examples of signatures where you can see a cross that it usually is identified by the signature of the those that uh, did this, uh, this affair in, in the courthouse. You also see these seals that I found beautiful particularly this one that is clear to see. You can see two columns and the, the coat of arms of the new Vizcaya and a ship that might represent the conquest or the arrival of the conquistadors into this land. The use of the seal was so important because it basically made the difference between an official document and a non-official document. The seals were owned by a mayor and the mayor will designate a special person, at least in the bigger cities, I don't know in Parral, but in bigger cities or provinces, there, was be, there will be a special person of high uh, social rank that owns or not owns, but managed and were, was the guardian of the official seals. And that's what you see here in many documents. The skills required for this, uh, to, to consult this archive. Well, I already talked about the paleography, which is the study of ancient and historical handwriting. It takes a skill to be able to read these several documents. Another skill is, of course, to speak and be have a vast knowledge in Spanish, but specifically in colonial Spanish, because the words change. It's the equivalent in English language of the Shakespearean English. English that is considered 
by some classical English. Well, it's just back in time. That's when I named this presentation Traveling in Time. Most of that is also because of the language. We have a very specific language and words that are no longer used in Spanish conjugations that no longer exist, or if they do, they exist in, in novels, in uh, formal academic Spanish, and others that are um, non-academic, more colloquial forms. What do you expect from minors? What do you expect from traders? They were not the most academic-oriented people. So they spoke as they spoke every day, meaning with a, not the most academic and royal observation of the grammar. Of course, you must have historical knowledge. We must know what is a real or a royal, what is a village, what were the main activities, how the, the, the geographical conditions were, the, the civil organization, the government, all these characteristics that helps you to understand and make the best out of these documents. Take a look at this document here and you will see a traditional handwriting of the 16th century or actually more of the 1500s, which is by extension uh, part of the same century in terms of writing. I'm not an expert on paleography whatsoever, but I can see that by the second half for the Mexican case, I don't know for Europe, but for the Mexican or the new Spain kingdom, it was until the second half of the 1700s in the 18th century that uh, the language start evolving more in terms of official records and the handwriting became uh, different. Let's say less Baroquian, less complicated until the 19th century where it became a manuscript that is way easier to, to read than the 15 and 1600s uh, typography. This one here is almost unreadable to my capacity. Uh, this one shows us the different circumstances of uh, preservation. Sadly, you can see here the, uh, the marks, the watermarks of uh, probably a flood or some kinds of uh, destruction uh, that made the paper got stained. In some cases, it was completely gone. This one here, it shows. So what can you make out of this? It's, it's difficult. It's, it's almost impossible. This one's, uh, the, the other one, uh, the previous one, has what I show you. It has this uh, ink that permeated into the page making it almost impossible to read because you see the, the back of the document here and then you see the front. And, but when you try to read it, it's, it's just not possible. Not possible because of the, of the stains. Some, as I said, are completely gone. The 1800s, Reclassification, you can see here one example. They will add a piece of paper with the seal and they will uh, add it to the bundle of documents. Take a look at these documents. These wars have gone forever. We will never know what was in those pages. Uh, the, the past, uh, the, the mark of the time has uh, taken this away from us in the historical memory. The other documents that we find, the different type of documents, 
are just uh, destroyed on the edges. You cannot read them completely. You only find the center words. And although some are readable, others are just, it doesn't make sense to translate one paragraph out of the whole page. So they're gone. They're gone forever. And the other one is, uh, other example that I want to show is that both. It has a very difficult uh, typography. See, for example, this E, N, E, N, in Las Minas. It's, uh, it's around the E. Then you also find stains, marks of mostly water or fungus, and it is cut in the edges. Some cases, in some cases, it looks like there was fire. Who knows, in, in perhaps in, in the archive, there was some moments before 1888, before that time, maybe some of these documents were put on fire or suffer something uh, from that which will be a shame and will be not the first case that I heard about uh, bureaucrats thinking, oh, who cares about these old papers? Oh, and they go and destroy them and they go and set them on fire. <laughs> oh, it happens, it happens. Maybe it happens, it happened a little bit in this barrel archive because some documents seem to have a mark, a fire mark of destruction. And this is also what the PDF, what the digitalization of this wonderful microfilm um, resource you can find. It will be depicted in whoever size you wanted to. Uh, print them or save them in your thumb drive. In some cases, I choose to do both pages. And then the resolution is good enough so you can zoom in the letters and you can actually have uh, good information, uh, which was uh, a very good news for me when I, I was able to zoom in. Uh, to to expand the size of the of of the pages or or the words, and that allowed me with a big screen that allowed me to transcribe them. Some are very neat, very clean, and when doing my research, once I checked the or read the index and took my notes of the different. Uh, documents that I wanted to review, I went and in my first experience at the, uh, using the microfilm, I realized that one thing is what the index says, and other thing is what is actually there. Because some documents, as you saw, are unreadable. So I had to base my research of the documents that I translated into what I was able to read because I was looking for a specific document and it turned out that the roles are not divided one by one. I mean, each frame has no number, so you have to count. And sometimes the document you want from the index is like 586 of uh, one role, one year. So you have to go to different roles and count one by one. And sometimes that document might not be available because it's stained, it's unreadable, or it simply does not exist in the role, wasn't filled. Who knows? Many reasons. For my final remarks, I want to talk about the uh, examples of what we can find. I found documents on different realms. 
as we know out of the five that there exist. I found civil court cases. I found uh, judicial uh, trials. And what I found was, for example, one document in which a person was suing another person for uh, selling bad quality mineral. This person said that it was not as as a it was not the measure the the accepted measure and quality of mineral and it was suing for the money he wanted his money back this person said that he didn't know that he did the best all the testimonies very interesting they they describe will say they swear by god they made the cross the symbol of the cross and swore in front of a crucifix that they were saying the true and nothing but the truth. It's so interesting. It reminds me to today's USA trials with the Bible on. Well, in the case of colonial Mexico, they were made with the crucifix on and they will make the blessing sign and they will say, I'm telling you the truth. But then you see one document and the other document and if both swore by the cross that they were saying the truth who has the truth <laughs> i also found one document of the judge saying this following document counterest and destroys well he didn't say that but he says uh counterest the preceding document and it shows that the document was false meaning somebody was caught in the lie <laughs> another document that i found talk about a mulatto the mulattoes were slaves and the slavery sadly was widely practiced although we don't find many names of mulattoes uh, in, in the mines, most of them were servants or work outside of the mines. Uh, it's interesting that in one case, a uh, Spaniard blamed his slave, his mulatillo, he says, his little mulatto, uh, for the uh, selling of bad quality mineral. Easy, I just blame on my servants. I think that happens still, right? The boss not doing what the boss should do and blame it on the employers. Well, in the case of this document, this Spanish man was blaming the bad business in, with his mulatto. That was his servant. Other documents that I found were talking about wheels where we can understand and take a, take a look of what people own, what was most valuable. Most valuable was, number one, minerals. To have pesos, to have uh, gold and silver, coin, usually coin, or in silver bars, of course. Who wants to take the stone? You want to have the bar. <laughs> so, uh, I found uh, wills in which people was saying how much money, how, mu how many pesos and reales uh, they had. I also found evidence of uh, cattle, it was valuable cattle. And other documents that I found were about disputes into who is denouncing a mine. Once the Spaniard arrived to the region and wanted to find or wanted to exploit a mine, it needed to have official permission because the mines, the territories, and everything in between was owned by the crown, by the Spanish crown. So uh, to have the designation to legally exploit the mine was very important because someone might claim owning that mine and you had to show the permission or the authorization by the king of Spain of 
uh, explored in that mine. I found several denouncings of mines in which people claim to have it denounced before the one who was exploiting it. And that, see, that show was that these mines were in dispute. Another documents I found was the proclaims of the mayors and the visits of the royal authorities, whether military authorities, ecclesiastical authorities, and of course, government administrative authorities. The governor of Santa Fe, New Mexico, visit in several locations, uh, Baral. And it's interesting because when these high authorities arrived to the town of Parral, they were welcome to uh, the town with a parade and with fireworks and with uh, bullfights, corridas de toro, who were highly popular and with music. Later on, the, the archives or, or the documents were turning into something that sadly Sadly, I was not able to, to, to do the research, which was the war with the Indians. Indian wars became at the last years of the 1600s and throughout the 17th century, the, the 1700s and the 19th or 1800s, uh, became more and more constant there was uh, a fight for two ways to understand the world, the colonial Western Spanish life and the native way of life. They will be denouncing of uh, mines in which Indians seem to be working. And in others, there's no mention of the racial conditions. But later on, we find uh, moments of deeply concern by the Spanish authorities of the Indian wars in which they will assault the, the village, the cities, and will pretty much kill a lot of people. Later on, the Spanish will take revenge. And the Spanish living in these territories will have to pay in many cases Many, many cases I found these documents, they will have to sponsor themselves this uh, war as the king of Spain was not providing any money for these resources. Or it will provide the, the, the militaries, but not the money or their salaries. That, was, that wasn't a good deal. <laughs> anyway. I want to finish this presentation uh, with uh, the, the notion of traveling in time. These documents, I still think, is, uh, are as close as you can get from this past. Yes, we can go to a museum, we can see paintings, we can see material artifacts, dresses, I don't know, uh, glasses, dishes, you name it, all kinds of objects. But the experience of reading the words of those from 400 or more centuries ago is exciting. I know for historians, it is very exciting. And I want to invite you all to visit the Center of Southwest Studies, to look at their wonderful resources, and why not to challenge yourself with colonial Spanish into these wonderful documents that allows you to travel back in time. I also want to thank the Ballantine family for sponsoring this wonderful experience of mine. I want to thank you for your kindness, for your help, for your support. I also want to thank all the donors that contribute to the existence of the Center of Southwest Studies. 
and also, of course, to Shelby Teasdale, the director of the center, Nick, particularly, who helped me with this archival research, and I want to thank you all for your attention. May this moment in her life, this pandemic, bring us a better understanding of what we want to achieve in her lives. Thank you for joining me, and thank you also for being with me. <laughs>